And this is why you guys can all find value in having things beyond just your music because Reese Witherspoon's Hello Sunshine sold for $900 million. She started a book club and then does a deal with these authors to get her book read by that book club and then turns those best books into TV shows and movies, sells them to Netflix and other companies. Like what Kanye did with um, Adidas and the Yeezy brand. You know, he had to collab and he was pushing it to his audience while he was building the fashion narrative. People are really taking to the design and things so we're gonna give you this entire shoe brand you know true what I'm, you know what I'm true to build off of right what's up what's up what's up i'm brand man sean i'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of no labels necessary podcast you can catch us every tuesday every thursday on youtube apple spotify wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency Today, we got a quick little mini soul for y'all. Some really dope topics focusing on business model, which is so important for creatives. Nobody has this talk enough. So we're going to talk about a genius business model that maybe you can get some inspiration for from. Two, we're going to talk about how the record labels business model is a little messed up and how artists can kind of think about their team in regards to that. And also... The last one, we'll keep it a surprise. Just a little update on one of our other topics that's become an ongoing thing. The first thing, the very first business model that I got to speak on. Speak gonna, gonna shock you with this. Gonna shock y'all with this because y'all <laughs> gonna be like, oh, I can't believe you're talking about this. Reese Witherspoon. That's crazy. I ain't heard that name in a minute. I think. In a minute. Yeah. That's because she's been working, y'all. <laughs> she's been working. Content creators, listen. Reese Witherspoon's Hello Sunshine sold for $900 million to some media company. I'm not going to even get into all those details. And this isn't new, by the way. This is in 2021. Now, what is the lesson to take away? Because I heard this news back when it happened, just randomly on a meme or something like that. But more recently, I've learned the business model that she uses and how she got things popping off. Reese Witherspoon started a book club. Okay, I was going to ask what is Hello Sunshine. It's a book club? No. Okay, actually, Jacory, Jacory wants to delay the payoff. I like what <laughs> you're doing there. <laughs> we about to find out what Hello Sunshine is officially. It's her media company, generally speaking. Okay, right? that, made, that, makes, right? that makes more sense. So, Reese Witherspoon's Hello Sunshine has been sold for north of $100 million, $900 million to a media company backed by private equity firm Blackstone. We talking money, money when you talk Blackstone. That's a, that's like 900 million, kind of yeah, that's a trillion dollar business you're dealing uh, with. Man. But here's the overall business model, right? So let me read another little quote and then I'll give you all th those details because it is worth listening to. Trust me. Today's marks today marks a tre tremendous moment for Hello Sunshine with Reese, <laughs> Reese Witherspoon <laughs> said in a statement. I started this company to change the way all women are seen in media over the past few years. We have watched our mission Oh, thrive through books, TV, film, and social platforms. Today, we are taking a huge step forward by partnering with Blackstone, which all enables us to be able to tell even more entertaining, entertaining impactful stories. All right, cool. Okay. So the all books, right. so the and Clyde, uh, the entire conglomerate actually does include the book club. Now, this is why it's genius, and this is why you guys can all find value. And having things beyond just your music because this is beyond her being an actress, right? She took a step back and started being a part of the back end. Yeah. So what did she do? She leveraged her influence. She started a book club for all her fans and women who are interested in her. Okay. All right? Uh -huh. She then took that book club and then made a deal with authors, probably authoresses. I'm sure that's a thing out there. You know, yeah, they, they flip everything. Yeah, I think so. You know what I mean? <laughs> Did a deal with all of those authors, and they would then read their book, right? Mm. Other women artists. So that's the pay plug into the, the audience. She, that she she's plugs already... them in. Wait, 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 wait. It's not just a normal paid plug, though. Okay. She has a book club, builds an audience with her clout for a book club, goes to authors and then does a deal with these authors to get her book read by that book club. Okay. Then she A-B tests which books are the best and most engaging books through the book club and then turns those best books into TV shows and movies, sells them to Netflix and other companies. God damn. That sounds like a mix of 
like Oprah and Tyler Perry, you know what I'm saying? With a little bit of Amazon. Yeah, a little bit of Amazon, yeah, exactly. It's a brilliant <laughs> business model. A brilliant business model. Because how many times do we see movies come from books yep. or video games and things like that? Uh-oh, somebody might need to figure out how to do that. For, now, video games, the way it happens, is a lot harder to get it popping. Yeah, you could, you could, you could, it's figure, you could figure it out faster, too. But there's some games. version yeah. of that, right? Yeah. But this is a clear, perfect example of how you can be known for one thing, right? Leverage your adjacent interest, mm -hmm. in this case, reading. And I've been saying, I've been saying book club for years to people. Yeah. Right? It's just one of those random interests. And I know when, out of all the opportunities we talk about, like gaming, like Smash Brothers tournaments and basketball tournaments and all these things, I always feel like people give book club the least energy because it don't sound like you can make money. But it's a clear example. Yeah. Right? She used it, A-B test, the power of A-B testing, and then literally used that to then adapt into movies. And, I mean, come on. You got a built-in fan base. Yeah. Everything is, it makes it easier to pitch because I can say, hey, yo, Ja'Cory, like people are already engaged around this. So it's an easier sale because you're worried about investing in something that's not going to get a sale. Yeah. Right. And then it becomes a bigger hit, which then I make money off of that back end too. But well, Reese is yeah. like, yeah, it's an ecosystem, man. Building your own ecosystem based off of your celebrity because every artist, what you're building is celebrity as a part of your brand is going to help you escape being in the hole or being escape the limitations of music money. That's why I keep saying that's my new model. Escape the, <laughs> the music money limitations, man. Like, hey, you ain't heard Reese like that. She acts in what she wants to. She don't have to be in a pop movie anymore. You know what I mean? She, she come out whenever she wants to. That's because yeah, she got that money. 900 million. I ain't doing no more movies. I'm in the house. <laughs> What's Dang. a uh, what's the other uh, woman name who has the Honest Company? She was Honey, honey that movie honey. honey is supposed to be like the hip hop Jessica. Alba. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, Jessica Alba. Yeah, well, hey, like they start getting that other money, and it creates freedom, right? So that's just one thing, business model. Now let's flip it to the music industry specifically. We just talked about the business model and the record uh, label. Specific category. Yeah, I was like, what, what would be the music equivalent of this? Well, oh, wait, wait. The music equivalent of this? Because yeah. I was going to switch to something totally different. Oh, shit, the my music bad. equivalent? Let's, let's oh, give it like a, a two-minute brainstorm. What would that be for, wait, within music or just for another artist and what they could do? Yeah, let's say for, let's say, let's say I'm Lil Corey. Lil Corey. And I want to apply this. I need to know about your demographic, though. My demographic is... 16 to 25 year old mixed race kids. Bro, we, we might need to do a real artist. Dog. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta do a real artist. <laughs> all right, let's say, let's say, all right, let's, let's make it easy. Travis Scott. Travis Scott. Okay. okay. <laughs> mm, Travis Scott. What would Travis Scott be able to do? There's so many categories. I mean, me, I Obviously, just, you do that with like a fast, fast, and fashion category. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. That's yeah. like the easy go to. Yeah. So you know, um, like see what people like, and then allow them select, uh, and then you know make something pop from there. Actually, I guess, I guess an example that's kind of been done is like what Kanye did with um, Adidas and the Easy brand. You know, because it started off as kind of like just you know he had to collab and he was pushing it to his audience while he was building the fashion narrative. And then I feel like eventually they kind of saw like, oh, like the designs are people are really taking to the designs and things. So we're going to give you this entire shoe brand, you know, true, what I'm you know what I'm true. Saying, to build off of. Right, right. I look at because it, it sounds to me it's like, all right, she built this focus group that she could use to monetize, use to monetize with other creatives. And then based on their performance within the focus group, she can monetize even higher by now turn it into a movie. So I kind of see the same way. It's like, hey, I can take your shoe, sell it to my audience, and if I see they like it enough, then just give me a whole, give me give me a shoe, like a real shoe. You know, right. Some shoe line. Test but, my designs, prove myself, and prove the designs. Yeah. And because I have, obviously, such an audience, you can see the hype around it. Yeah. Because we exactly. can always just kill a shoe if we want to. Yeah, exactly. We can just put the design out. It's not getting the vibe. You know, and that, we see a lot of stuff with that too. That th those things that never came out, you'd be like, "Well, what happened to the X Y O? Only two were actually made, or ten mm -hmm. were actually made, or it was never released." And they say it's like some 
other non-business yeah. related thing, but really it was the fact that it wasn't yeah. gonna sell. It's like, oh, the materials are no longer available. Right, so like, right, right. <laughs> like, All that kind of stuff. <laughs> so yeah, that I think that's a good enough example. We should do a, a episode that deep dives on that though. Like try to find those type of examples. We're gonna switch up for now, but I like that actually as a, gr- a gr- great idea. So. All right, so I want to give a reminder that being independent is not just about not being signed to a label. It's actually making money without being signed to a label, being able to have a sustainable career. And for those of y'all who actually want to be able to make money from your fan base, you're serious about figuring out how to monetize. I have a free video that you can check out. I don't need your email. I don't need your phone number. I don't need any information. All you have to do is go to www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash monetize. And I'm going to show you the lies that artists have been told that have been keeping them, probably you too, from monetizing your fan base and how shifting that perspective has allowed one artist we're working with to be on track to make over $500,000 this year. This is a different era. Don't fall for that trap saying artists can't make money. Artists do not have to be broke. So if you want to escape that trap, go to www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash monetize. You do have to make sure you put the www in the beginning when you type it in your URL and watch this free video again. You're not going to be asked to put in your email. You're not going to be asked for your phone number, but it won't be up forever. Check it out. The record labels and an issue with the business model I was just talking about. And many of y'all might not actually have had one of these scenarios um, happen to you or know of these uh, scenarios, but a lot of times you have these A and R's, if you will, or just middlemen, if you will, mm-hmm. that will, you will build up artists and send them over to the labels, right? Yeah, and it sounds like a great deal. It's like, hey, a little Corey, I'm gonna come to you, I'm gonna get you popping, and now that you're popping, I've built your market value and I can sell you off to the labels. Yeah, but here's the real issue that happens a lot of times. You have somebody who works with an artist, helps build them up, sells them off to the label, but you get rid of one of the most valuable parts of that artist or their path and their blow up because that person who was really integral in blowing them up sold them off to the label and now the label doesn't necessarily know what to do with them. And sometimes, a lot of times, the artist doesn't know what to do with themselves because that person was way more integral than the artist thought. Mm-hmm. Right, that'd be the, that'd be the big. One. <laughs> That's the thing, and then the label <laughs> is like you're investing in like half of a business because mm-hmm. that goes into underappreciating the value. Let's just say this marketer, a and r, whoever who leveraged their resources and maybe even like directed the artist, told them what to do throughout certain scenarios, and now you're just left with the artist, and it's bad for everybody. Mm-hmm. Right, labels like oh man, I don't know what to do with this. Next thing you know, you know, well we'll, we'll just drop them. We'll just consider that one of the L's. So there should be in every other industry, well, most industries that I know of, they have a clause when they buy a business, they try to negotiate something where you have to stay on for a year or two. There's a transition period before you can leave because we don't want all of a sudden the company to just blow up. Everybody say, hey, we were loyal to Corey or or there's too much IP of why things were working. And we need to make sure the transition is smooth, right? Mm -hmm. That same thing exists with these artists. And I feel like people don't acknowledge that enough. If an artist starts taking off and there's people around them, don't just allow that. I mean, I don't know who that's worse for, the record label side or the artist. Because at least the artist got in a better position. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now they're signed. Well, could, but then they got in a better position for a moment in time. Yeah, I was about to say, yes. It's it's temporary. Temporary good position. Temporary. (laughs) But now you're like just flailing in this label, unacknowledged. Nobody knows what to do with you. The vision that got you there is not longer. uh, And the person who was selling you to other people. That's another part. They just helped you and sold you to another organization. That means not... It's not just about selling you to the label. You still need that selling ability and understanding how to pitch you ability throughout everything you're doing as an artist. Because a great manager is always pitching you to like playlist or well, people they know around playlist. Sometimes it's directly a playlist, sponsors, booking agents, whoever. Right? You always need somebody who has the ability to pitch you. And if you just get passed off, and you know, needless to say, some of these artists. 
managers are not necessarily that one that got them there. Yeah, see, I think that's where it gets lost, right? Because there are those positions that have, I think, seen that and figure out ways to bake themselves in. Typically, I see it being managers and A&Rs. Like, managers and A&Rs are find a way to stay attached to the, the situation, right? Some of them. Some of them, yeah, good point. Because you got them. some of these guys who are like, all right, I'm going to pass you off, and I'm going to get – a managerial fee, even though I'm not even going to be involved. Yeah, or the A&R that's like, I'm going to pass you off. I'm on to the next hot hot guy just on. Right. right. I gotta, yeah. I'm trying to build like, another business yeah, and exactly. sell it off. Yeah. Buy and sell yeah. is my entire way of moving. They flipping. Man, but it, cause I, I do feel like what's so hard, what's hard about that is like it's, it's hard sometimes to like quantify who was actually impactful in yep. the blow up until – to your point, you can kind of step back and look at the... Now that the process is over with, you can analyze it more clearly. Yep. And then you start to see, like, damn, bro, that, that videographer I hired, like, I'm really seeing, like, people saying they missed the old look of my videos and I'm realizing that dude I got rid of to go get, you know what I'm saying, Hype Williams or some shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, that right, shit. I'm paying that 10x shit. the amount of money <laughs> but, and but, then people but, not messing with it. Yeah, exactly, but 0.5x the results. So I, I, I do think that's... That's one of the issues, like especially when the artist is blowing. It's like shit be moving so fast, like it's so hard to like sit down and analyze. We've been in that position, man. How many times have we been, you know, work with a nice little bright eyed, you know, indie artist? You know, they pop off, label come scoop them up. They're like, all right, we're going, you know, throw you to the label marketing team. We're like, all right, bro, you know, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun working with you while it lasted. Hopefully, we see you back in another. Yeah. Three, four months, not for, you know, for, for good reasons, but like we've been in that position where it's yeah. like, man, you know, I get it. It's going to be hard for you to fight for the marketing team, yeah. but you need us. You know what I'm saying? Because right. we've already done the research. To your point, I think, too, it's like, man, we spent, like, there have been clients where we spent two years just talking to them to understand them enough mm. to give yeah. them even a, a inkling of success. And then to your point, they never get passed off to this group of people that, not only have to learn them, but they have to also learn them while figuring out how to keep the momentum going and keep growing them. It's a yeah. hard thing to do, you know what I'm saying? While they're also handling other artists. Yeah, exactly. While out, and a lot of other artists, too, you know, when you talk about against that level. So it's like, yep. uh, man, I was just telling somebody that, man. I had a conversation with another client off line, and I was saying, like, that's the interesting thing about, I think, artists working with labels is, like, they sell you on... You have this team, this individual team, but what they don't tell you is that everybody there is working on a hundred other things at mm -hmm. the same time. So like you are like, oh, I got a marketer, I got an A and R, but then that marketer got fifty other artists on his roster. So you might realistically get thirty minutes of that person's time and work yeah. out the whole week, you know. And then people look at us like, oh, y'all expensive. It's like, yeah, but we only working with like fifteen people, man. So you know, more expensive, but more time. So yeah, I I do more get it. Attention, hands on. I do get it, man. It's, and we only work with 15 people no more. Don't get that out there. Don't put that in the universe. Oh, you're right. My bad, y'all. Don't listen to that. <laughs> like about five max. And I think, too, it has to do with just, like, like how do you quantify? Because to your point, right, like, if I'm an artist, let's say I've, I've somehow looked up and I got eight people helping me with different things, yeah. right? When I pop... Or when I have a big moment, all eight of them are going to evenly feel like their contribution is what helped me get here. The booking that is going to feel like, yo, me getting you on that open and set up rolling loud really pushed you a long way, right? The yeah. marketer is going to feel like, hey, me optimizing those ads and getting those five or six influencer posts really helped you out. Mm -hmm. The A&R is going to be like, yo, me help connecting you with that one producer really helped you out. So then how do you as an artist or a person that's a core part of the artist team accurately assess whose contributions really were what helped you go. Because there's an argument made that all of them, all of their contributions are the reason you're here. So should all of them make a case to, you know, be sunsetted in, you know? Or do you mm -hmm. step back and go like, all right, eight of you were impactful. Maybe, maybe all, maybe, uh, yeah, eight of you all contributed, you know, well, eight of you were impactful. Six of you only contributed 10%. These other two contributed 20% a piece, right? And so I'm, <laughs> I'm taking these two with me. You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you, how do you quantify that? Yeah, it requires discernment for sure. I think it's understanding, for one, the artists themselves, all right? So it's going to be a little subjective, but and also the fan base is like, what seems to be most important to the fans, mm -hmm. all right? And how can I control that? It's like when you think about a marketing department, these days the best marketing departments for, for companies 
are in house because yep. they understand the brand, the taste, yep. you know, all of that, so they can better communicate that and they can keep things consistent, which leads to more impact. So, if you have like this consistent videographer where your artist has a good rapport and you're like, oh yeah, my artist like is comfortable with this person, so they have better videos as a result. Mm -hmm. Right, you pay attention to those things, and I think that's especially important for maybe a manager to pay uh, to pay attention to, um, or you know that. Well, I think the videographer thing is 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 easier to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Who else would be on the team? You can get you can get fan feedback on that, right? You know what I'm saying, yeah. Marketer, then you'll just be like, does this marketer? tend to understand what's going on mm -hmm. with this artist. Like, do they just seem to see the vision? They come up with really great narratives. They seem to mm -hmm. get the artist pitch ideas that have a high percentage of the artists actually liking versus, you know, because, you, you know, we could throw out plenty of ideas and the artist just doesn't stick, yeah. right? So I think it's just judging those little things based on what someone's doing first. Um, like not even among all eight people, let's just say if there's eight people around the artist that they've worked with over time, just first of all, like what's their quality of impact based on what they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and yeah. Once you get that baseline, then you see is there like, so are they top level that? Then you start to gauge like, all right, do they go beyond that somehow? Do they creep into other areas where, you know, like us, yeah, we can do ads for people or something like that, but then and we can pitch some ideas to go around a song, but we also do like creative direction. Or mindset you know I mean? shifts. Mindset shifts, yeah, yeah. We, we, we coaching and things like that. Yeah. Like, I mean, I will literally have this one guy, you know, I'm telling him the exact angles. It's like, no, you need to be closer up when you shoot this shot for this video, and then this happens and that needs to happen. And then he'll shoot a video and then we'll make some adjustments on how to come back. Like, those are like smaller details and then but you have to also probably have some context of what another me looks like. Because if mm -hmm. you're not comparing me to anybody mm -hmm. or don't know, because I think that's a lot of times. Some people, let's just say we're us. We'll talk ourselves up for a second. Yeah. All right? If we're their first experience, they don't know who to, like, the context of, like, oh, other marketers might not know X, Y, and Z. Man. Right? Or do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Right? Um, and we pride ourselves on like really staying on the cutting edge. Well, and I think part of it is just because we've had to, right? So we've just trained to look at everything mm -hmm. differently. So I think yeah, it's one impact on fans and like what is that? Is there a synergy there in terms of like what this person is doing is having a high impact on the fans? Two, is there a synergy with the artists that things just seem to click, right? Uh, three, of course, and not this is not in any particular order. Do they do the job that they're supposed to do at a high level? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And if you don't, let's just say, hey, man, I sucked at running ass. I'm supposed to be the ass guy. I sucked at running ass, and I'm not really good at getting influencers like that. Mm -hmm. But, boy, I'm really coaching and getting the artists in their bag and pitching these ideas. Then you say, all right, well, how can I get him off of those things? But I still understand his impact enough that he needs to be here. And that's the difference between – great coaches in sports, right? Yeah. They understand their pieces. Phil Jackson, when Dennis Rodman say, yo, bro, can I go to Vegas? And we in the middle of the playoffs. And he say, yeah, go ahead. Because he know that Dennis Rodman got to get his thing going and he's going to be good. But if I was playing, I would not be able to go to Vegas and come out <laughs> like moving like Dennis. Most people can't do that. But, he had, yeah. but you understand that he psychologically has a different way of moving. So... I guess that all that to say is, you know, pay attention to your people and pay attention for them and then pay attention to the, the team collective as a whole. Cause that really what it is. It's, it's, it's team psychology. Yeah. And I think it, it's crazy. Cause now that I think about it, it, it ties back to the bigger narrative of labels don't like to develop talent. And I mm -hmm. think we tend to think about that musically, but then what I'm hearing in your point is like it also applies to just the back end time of the artist, right? Because to your point, yeah. right, like the, that marketer that maybe sucks at running ads, but he's he or she is really good at getting the artist out of the comfort zone with the content, and maybe that's been what's make, been making the ad swing. The ad setup has been shitty, but he's been coaching him through some good ideas, so it worked out. The easy way would be okay, yeah, we're gonna just replace you with an, an ad person. I think the better way would be like, all right. 
let us help you get better at this thing so we can keep you here because then everybody wins the answer. We don't have to like mess up the flow of this operation. You get a level or two better, which like if you were doing great with a shitty skill set, imagine how amazing you're gonna be once the skill set is sharpened, right? Mm, I know yeah. this this is an easier one, like we're talking about ads, which is an easier skill set to sharpen like that, but from what I've seen, yeah, most of them are not doing that. <laughs> They're not gonna do that. It's a time thing. Like, you know, yeah. like I I know I know a person that got a job at a label and like they were basically talking about it like when they got the job, they were just kind of thrown into the fire. Like there was no real like training period. There was no real it wasn't like an orientation period where they like, oh, this is the right way to kind of do things. They just had to come in, you know, pay attention, listen and pick up and then just get into get into flow, right? Cuz you look at it, it's a hundred people with a hundred things to do every day. Nobody has time to stop you and go like, yo, like this is the way we send emails. This is the way we Right. And then they might teach you as you fuck up. You know what I'm saying? And that's yeah. how they train you. It's like, oh, you messed this up. Don't do not do that. This is the right way to do it. But they're not, like, formally sitting down. Like, when we hire, like, Marcus, stuff, like, we put them through, like, a training period. You know what I'm saying? We're like, all right, we're going to you, – you hop on the call with me and Sean, you know what I'm saying, like, two or three times a week, you know what I'm saying, every week for, like, the next three weeks. And then, and then we throwing you into the fire. I don't think – yeah, I, I, won't, I won't say every label isn't doing it, but I would argue most of them aren't doing that. You know what I'm saying? But then – you look at it and it's like you look at the artist as this dominant in the rough that needs to be developed. Most artists aren't getting picked up out of obscurity. They've more than likely built some type of a team around them. And what I think labels do fuck up at is they go like, how can I replace these people around you rather than how can I just insert people into this operation you've already mm-hmm. built and give you resources to make your team stronger, which I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm built different, but that's what I would do because I'd be looking like, oh, you already got an ad guy? Great, we can save some money on our side. You know what I'm saying? And not <laughs> you already got an ad guy, and he already expecting to eat off of your top line. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, yeah. this is beautiful, bro. Like, yeah, what he need? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the you know, and that's where the conflict <laughs> of labels comes in when they have all these bureaucratic corporate initiatives or the way they're trying to save money and get things go- done that prevent them sometimes of from doing what's best for an artist because mm-hmm. really it's easier and it's less work even on you individually. Yeah. But then, you know, a label might be like, well, I want all this ad data or, you know, we've talked about. We don't trust your homie with the with the, the budget. How right. we know he going to spend the whole 10K. But all these different things. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and they'll throw stuff out like that to hide their real reasons. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, that's a good angle I'm going to come at. But I really, I just don't want to give it over yeah. and then you got those opportunities like uh like you talked about the i mean even we've got these opportunities we just don't use them i just thought about it you know the um the free money we'll get from the ad programs and stuff uh, like yeah. that yeah you like, like the, the gratis yeah 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 um but i feel like we can get to yeah, more deeper into that maybe another episode let's get into the last topic quick topic quick little update okay you know the theory, <laughs> right? That this Drake AI song being submitted for a Grammy helps further prove that this is probably some label that is behind this whole situation, right? Mm-hmm. There, we talked about that theory, and a huge thing that I, I, I spoke on was like, oftentimes when you you take situations like this, because we know that there are rights issues, you can't. Um, what is it, copyright of voice, mm-hmm. right, or, or whatever the particular right. language is, right? So anybody can take my voice. It's not technically illegal yet because the tech is ahead of the actual laws. Well, all right, cool. If I can't do that, I can make something really bad happen, something really obvious happen at scale, so then I can then make an argument to the government, yo, we need to do something about this. They're using this guy's voice. This song is taking off. It's doing so well. And this is a travesty to Drake. This is a travesty to week to the weekend. This can tarnish his brand. Why would we allow people to use people's voices without their permission? All right. I can make that better argument no different than when X, FTX collapsed. I can then make better arguments to regulate the crypto industry. All right. So there's that theory. And we were like, piecemealing certain things together saying oh umg might be behind this because they got drake 
and 21 Savage mm-hmm. and the 21 Savage song just came out and um They're all universal artists yeah all these universal artists that are attached to this however there's also that theory that Jake is the artist who did the Ghost Rider stuff mm-hmm. so here's an alternate theory if it's not UMG behind all of it like in terms of like they didn't create the Ghost Rider situation here's an alternate for me as UMG, let's just still pretend it's UMG that's still using this so I can expedite the regulation in this spot. Mm-hmm. Corey, you're not a UMG artist. You just do this dumb song for fun using Drake in a weekend. Mm-hmm. Me as UMG, I didn't like that this could happen anyway, but I might say, you know what? This is my opportunity. Let me help blow you up and make a big fuss around you so then I could still make the regulation argument. So I didn't create the spark, but I leveraged the spark. Mm -hmm. And a lot of business opportunities, just media manipulation, even things that we do, right, is not some things get created and then some opportunities come to you Mm -hmm. and you leverage that. Mm -hmm. So it might have been one of those things as well. They might not have created it, but they might very well be helping push it along or create some level of attention for it yeah. in some way or just making a big fuss about it just as that example so their fuss adds to the attention only hole in that argument because I'm just having fun for the conspiracy sake of it but um, the only hole in that argument is well this next Grammy consideration thing that would have still had to come from that camp if they're not a part of it that would still have to come from the artist that has nothing to do with them and Jake isn't a, if, and if it is Jake, as people like to say, um, because of that video of the guy doing a deep dive, uh, what will his incentive be to UMG, which I wouldn't see any, you know, I feel like that's a stretch. But still, just the exercise of it, I think these are things that are important for people to think about. We talk about business models and just leveraging things. All right, sometimes you can expedite a situation that to the masses seems like it's not beneficial to you at all so then you can use that as leverage in a different space and it happens all the time man they 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 play the public so much man they play the public oh like a violin and i just be so sad sometimes when i realize how how uh you know how gullible the public is that's just that's the nice way to say it beautiful man the public won't gullible we won't have a job man i know (laughs) i know (laughs) I got to take the good <laughs> with the bad, man. Y'all keep being gullible. Not y'all, but, you know, those of y'all that watch it. The, 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 the masses that yeah, be. Keep being gullible. The fans <laughs> of the artists and, and, and those out there, for sure. But that's it for this episode. <laughs> Just wanted to drop some quick thoughts for y'all. Let us know how y'all like this type of flow. This is yet another episode another episode of No Labels Necessary <laughs> Podcast. I'm Brandman Shine. I'm Corey. And we out. Peace.